give blood and you can save someone's life today. Unless, of course, you're a gay man, in which case, please don't. Are the rules on blood donation born of science or prejudice? A gay rights campaigner and a scientist will put their cases. Now, do something amazing is the slogan of the blood donation service. It ought to read, do something amazing, unless you're a gay man, because men who've ever had oral or anal sex with other men, even using protection, are asked not to give blood. Many gay groups consider this ban antisocial as well as discriminatory. The rules being reviewed right now with a decision expected in the next few weeks. Before we talk about it, our science editor Susan Watts reports. When this theatre student's mother fell seriously ill, the hunt was on to find a suitable blood donor. When mum was diagnosed with leukaemia in 2007, the whole family came down to Gloucester to support her. All of her brothers were asked to donate, our huge extended family. This woman who used to babysit mum, her son was tested. My brother was asked to donate, but I wasn't, because I'm gay. No stranger to new writing, the Soho Theatre let Didge in to perform for us some of the play he wrote about his experiences. He wants the ban lifted. So there's this um, huge body of people um, that um, are uh, potential donors that are going to be able to help save lives. And uh, there are all these people that are being excluded basically because of um, a statistic that says that they're the highest risk group. And it's not actually based on um, the individual um, behaviour. Although Didge recognises that safety has to come first, he feels the current lifetime ban is discriminatory. The question I used to ask, when was your last risky sex? Not do you have sex with men? Because you could have sex with men for a, with, a, with a condom every single time. You know, you could be with the same partner for 10 years and you're still uh, not able to give blood. So I think it should be based on the, the risk of the sex, not uh, banning an entire group. The blood services across the UK have to weigh the rights of the individual and the rights of the public to be confident the blood supply is as safe as it can be. But why not narrow down who's excluded? We, we need 7,000 donors every single day to keep the NHS supplied with, with blood. And so a detailed sexual history from every donor is, is really not feasible. And also, of course, we may deter more donors by adding intrusive questions about their personal lives. It is right that the policy is reviewed according to the current evidence because uh, we do need the buy-in and the, and the trust of, of the public and of our donors uh, that the policies we have are in place for a very good reason and that is simply to protect the safety of patients and not for any other reason. What happens in other countries varies widely. Australia, Argentina, Japan and Hungary allow donations from men who've not had sex with other men within the last year. In the European Union, a directive says countries must have a ban but not how long it must be. Sweden was due to shift to a one-year rule, but won't now until it has the facilities for full interviews of donors. America and Canada have decided to keep a lifetime ban in place. The result of the UK review should be out this summer, with the recommendation from scientists to government expected in a couple of weeks' time. There's one group remembered here at St Bottles Church in the City of London for whom the safety of blood is paramount. Thousands of haemophiliacs have died after being treated with contaminated blood products in the 1970s and 80s. They were infected with viruses such as HIV and hepatitis C before we were testing for them. Their worry is that there may be other viruses out there that we don't yet know about. Some haemophiliacs support lifting the ban, but for others, linked to that community, erring on the side of caution is the only option. Carol Grayson's haemophiliac husband, Pete, died six years ago. Well, Pete was exposed to HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C and variant CJD. And unfortunately, lessons weren't learned from the past. So that when CJD came along, they should have actually looked back historically and they could have made changes to the system.
And that's why I feel now that safety has to be the top priority and it would be ill-advised to lift the ban. She says there are other ways that gay men could contribute, such as introducing new donors, even though they themselves can't donate. I really do understand your position because I was a blood donor and I went along with my father for the first time age 18 and I was very proud to donate blood and I really appreciated the value of doing that and I was so disappointed you know, when Pete was infected and I realised that my own rights had been violated and I could no longer donate blood. I've tested negative many, many times. I can't donate now but would they be happy to accept my blood? You know, would they take my blood in their veins? What the government will have to decide now is whether someone like Ditch is still being excluded for the right reasons. Please give blood. Give it for my mum. Give it for me. Because I can't. Well, with us now to discuss this are the uh, human rights uh, activists uh, Peter Tatchell and in Dublin, Professor Ian Franklin. Professor Franklin, when you come across a case like that where... Uh, uh, a young man is unable to give blood even to help his own mother. The ban seems lunacy, doesn't it? Uh, well, good evening, Jeremy. No, no, I certainly don't think it appears to be um, lunacy. Certainly in the UK, um, obviously in a very small piece, it's difficult to follow the, the detail, but it would be quite unusual to ask uh, a close relative to give a blood transfusion uh, for a relative in the UK. So, well, his brother I I, was I, and he wasn't because he was gay. Well, well, OK. Uh, I mean, the, the, the rules at the moment are quite clearly in favour of maintaining safety, and that's the job of the professionals who run the blood system and the blood supply in the UK. Um, and and the, there is a clear um, tendency for men who have sex with men, most of whom, of course, are gay, um, to have an increased risk of HIV and when we see uh, donations and test those donations the ones that we'd find that are positive for viruses particularly HIV but not only HIV there is a tendency for those to come from uh, men who for whatever reason have decided not to disclose right. uh, previous now, uh, gay, gay sexual activity. Let me just activity. bring in so, Peter Tatchell here if I, if, if I may sure, Professor. Yeah. I mean, you would agree that safety has to come first, Peter Tatchell. It is the absolute priority. I mean, we must protect the blood supply and be sure that patients get safe blood. But I don't think we need a lifetime ban to achieve that. Under the current ban, any man, not just gay man, but any man who's ever had oral or anal sex with another man any point in their life is banned for life from donating blood. Even if they're now married with kids and perhaps they had gay sex once or twice when they were 14 or 15, even if they used a condom, even if they test HIV negative, that heterosexual man is banned for life. It doesn't make sense. Professor Franklin, I, I, why ban someone from giving blood even if they've only had safe sex? Uh, well, I think everyone knows that condoms don't, don't always work. Uh, heterosexual couples can have children with, with failures of condoms. Um, the business about uh, um, monogamous couples, uh, we know from heterosexual couples that uh, you can never really be sure uh, about your partner. You can only attest to yourself. Um, I, think it, I think the point about the lifetime ban, the lifetime ban was brought in uh, at a time when HIV was not understood. What, what we're concerned about now continues to be HIV, but it also, it also is emerging viruses. When HIV came in, there was a two to three year period when people were perfectly well able to donate. There was no test. There was no knowledge about the condition. And we really need to make sure that there is, there's no change. Now, it, when the, uh, you, you introduced Peter as a, as a, as a human rights activist, and I, I, one thing I would like to, to get across is that if, if there is a feeling that this is a human rights issue, I would argue that that's a political decision. Uh, you, you shouldn't sure. really be expecting scientists and medical no, no. experts Absolutely. to say that to, to, the, to the attest to something that's going to be slightly less. The decision less will be it, taken by government, of course it will, uh, uh, yeah. uh, but on the advice of, of, of scientists, that's what we're trying to get to. What, what would you be yeah. happy with, Peter Tatchell? Well, first of all, let me say that the American Red Cross and the American Association of Blood Banks have both considered this issue and taken expert advice, and they all say that a lifetime plan is over the top unnecessary, that a one-year deferral period would be adequate.
Um, whether it's one year or a bit less or a bit more, the point is most gay and bisexual men do not have HIV and will never have HIV and their blood is safe to give. So we need to find a new policy. That would require more intrusive questioning, wouldn't it? Well, I think most gay and bisexual men will be very happy to answer more questions. I would also only support a change in the policy if it went hand in hand with a public education campaign to alert gay and bisexual men about the risk factors and about who and who not should donate blood. Professor Franklin, would a one-year ban sound sensible to you, given how much further we are on with the science of uh, HIV? Well, well, well I, I, you see, my feeling is it's not all about HIV. Um, <clears throat> with regard to HIV, a one-year ban probably is okay, but it's, it's what other infections uh, may come along. We know that, uh, unfortunately, men who have sex with men, mostly gay men, uh, have in the past been uh, a source for um, new and unknown infections coming through. Right, so you're worried so, about... So I uh, think, can I just... Can, well, my, it's you're my job to make sure... Unknown infections, but, but why doesn't the same, the same caution apply to men who use prostitutes, for example, with whom it is a 12-month ban? Okay, yeah, well, the, in the... Well, certainly if you look historically and if you look now, men who have sex with prostitutes just don't feature in those... Uh, positive donations that come through. So they, they don't appear to be a risk. It, it may be that pe men who have sex with prostitutes aren't the sort of people that come forward to give blood. I don't know the answer but to that. To, to but give simply, you we, we look at the detail of the people who give blood. We look at the tests that we get. Everything's tested, as you know. And the ones that are positive are investigated. So it's really by investigating those cases that we can... Uh, right. come to a good risk assessment. Okay, please attach. The problem with the policy is the double standards. A heterosexual businessman who goes to New York regularly and has unprotected sex with lots of women in a city where there's a huge HIV mm. pandemic, he can donate blood. But a gay or bisexual man who's in a long-term monogamous relationship or who is celibate or who only once ever had or twice ever had mm. gay sex, they are banned for life. That discrepancy, that double standard grates, and it is depriving the blood service of potential donors whose and blood is safe. And you worry about as yet undiscovered conditions? Well, that, that, is, that is a concern, but it has to apply across the board. The, the stigmatizing mm. and, 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 and special status and restrictions imposed on men who've had sex with men strikes me as wrong and not scientifically valid, and if there are going to be restrictions, they should apply to everyone who has risky behavior, regardless of right. sexual orientation. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you.